Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament book of Ephesians. The New Testament book of Ephesians in chapter number 5. Ephesians in chapter number 5. Of course, we've been taking some time to go through what the Bible has to say about music. And we've enjoyed going through and seeing how the Bible has placed emphasis on the melody and that we've understood a little bit about what worship is inside of music and that our music should match our worship. We understood and we explained a little bit about the Psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs. But tonight we're going to do something just a little bit different and we're going to hit a little bit about music theory. Now what is music theory? I'll explain that here in just a bit. But if you don't mind, let's start off with the Bible and notice with me in the book of Ephesians chapter number 5. The book of Ephesians chapter number 5 and notice with me if you wouldn't mind starting at verse (laughs) number 16. The book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 16. The Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, where is an excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And once again, as we put an emphasis here where it tells us that we're supposed to sing to ourselves and that we're supposed to make melody, what we're going to hit tonight is the idea of music theory. Music theory theory. And let's go to the Lord together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come up to you tonight, I'm just asking that you would just help. I know that this is more of a classroom lecture. This is more of an informational, less spiritual, but more practical. I'm asking that this would be a help and maybe some people could become better singers, better congregational singers, or at least have a better understanding of the hymns and the notes and why we use the hymn books because of what we learn here. And we love you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, music theory is the basic study of how music works. So that's pretty simple. And we want to see how music works. So with this, there's some basic information. Now I'm taking, this is more of an elementary, middle school type idea. But again, most of us didn't pay attention even if we had those classes anyway. Some boring music teacher talking about notes and staves and whatever else. Those who are musicians know a little bit more. However, because we use hymn books and it's an One of the reasons why we use hymn books rather than just songs um, listed on the screen is because we actually see the music. And there is a different information that we find that should be helpful. If you don't mind, let's go ahead and we'll cover the three parts of music as we had explained them before. That music has three parts. It has melody, (laughs) it has harmony, and it has rhythm. We've explained this before. So let's cover, first of all, the information included in a song. Whenever we look at a hymn book, there's going to be some things you're going to notice right away. The names that are associated with the song lyrics are going to be shown underneath the title, and they're going to be on the left-hand side. So as we're using this uh, song, Away in a Manger, as an, uh, <coughs> as um a basis here, we could see that the first two verses away from a manger are anonymous, meaning we don't know who wrote them. But the third verse was actually written by John Thomas McFarlane. He's the one that added the third verse. So no matter what hymn you open to on the very left hand side is going to be who wrote the actual lyrics, who wrote the actual words. Now (laughs) this would include the author of the words Maybe sometimes even the translator. You'll see that in some of the, the uh, uh, hymns that it translated by. This is going to be on that left-hand side. Whereas on the right-hand side, the information listed on the right-hand side is going to be those that were involved in writing the actual music. 
So sometimes you'll have someone who's a poet, they'll write a poem, but then someone will place that poem to music. Whoever puts the actual music to it is going to be listed there on the right. <coughs> so this would be include the melody. Also, sometimes people will arrange it, some different arrangements. They'll be placed there. They'll have a little ARR. That means arranged by. Now, a single date identifies when the words and music was written. As we could see here in Await from a Manger, the first two verses were written one year, the last verse was written another year, and then it was arranged at a different time by someone else. We'll see that quite often in some hymn books. If the year of authorship is about a song and its history, just by looking at some of the information that some hymn books have. The title of the song is usually given <laughs> to the lyric poem by its author, meaning the author is usually the person who named it. Some songbooks end up using the first words of the first stanza as the song title. That happens from time to time if it wasn't previously named. At the bottom we'll see copyright information and that's important to note because most music will have copyrights and for, for um, musicians to use it on a live stream there's a certain copyright stuff that they need to know about or some singers begin to use it. And copyright information is important. That means someone still has it, uh, the rights to it and you have to be careful with it. It's no, good to notice who wrote it. To be safe it's always... <laughs> uh, wise to assume that the song is under a copyright unless there's some reason for you to believe that it's not. Again, there's legalities and this is one of the things why after we live stream music we cut it off on our personal stream and just put the sermons on it because we don't want to mess with the copyright issues. All right, the name of the copyright owner follows the copyright date. In this case, in this song, Hope Publishing Company is the one who currently has the uh, copyright to that song. And again, it just useful information that knowing that someone actually owns the song and that we see the phrase all rights reserved but we could see used by permission that they got permission by the person who owns the rights to put it in that hymn book and to use it so letting them know that they didn't steal it which by the way is very American now we copy and paste and steal pictures from the internet we steal songs whatever else we should be above board in everything that we do now let's cover pitch notation I know that this kind of stuff is like, oh man, I didn't stay awake in seventh grade. Why should I pay attention now? Well, again, we're trying to help you a little bit by understanding how music works so we can be better singers inside of our congregation. Now, languages must have a written form in order to preserve express thoughts, meaning that we have to know what words are if we're going to understand what someone is saying. Well, music also has a language and we must understand how that language works. Now, music's written form is called notation. Now, pitch is the highness or the lowness of a tone. So if I have a high-pitched voice or a low-pitched voice, that's carrying the idea of the frequency, the, the lowness of a tone, the highest of the tones. The higher tones are produced by a large number of vibrations a second than lower. That's technical speak, just saying where we get it, that there's higher vibrations or more vibrations, the higher the sound. The lower the vibrations, the lower the sound. <clears throat> Now, pitches are graphically represented on a staff consisting of five lines and their associated spaces. So if we look at a staff, you're going to have spaces and you're going to have lines. So here is just a pitch notation, just trying to see if we had lines. You would have a space below, a first space, second space, third space, fourth space, and the first space above, and then you would have the lines. Now, this is just saying that each of these are a different pitch. You start going up and go up a scale. Now each line in each space is called a degree. Again, we're not <laughs> getting technical, but we're going up each degree, each little part that we go. The staff makes 11 degrees available. Now this is important. We're building a foundation. You will probably forget this, but this will help your understanding of music when you put it together. Now, a brace is a designated set of five lines as a staff. So we could see the line that goes here. That's a brace that puts that staff together. And of course, as we could see the staff, it is consisted of one, two, three, four spaces, and then five lines.
Good. Now the cleft at the beginning of its staff designates the pitch range to be sung. Let me give you an illustration. We have an F cleft. Good. I missed one. Nope, I did not. Forgive me. So this is the F clef. Uh, it's placed at the beginning of a staff to designate the male pitched voice. So when you see this little curved line, this shows that it's the male form. Inside of your music, this is going to be the lower part of the grand staff. Now, each degree on a staff is qualified by a pitch range, defining by adding a clef sign and has a name. The name of the pitches represented on a staff are A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then it starts all over again, A, B, C, D. So it only goes up to A to G. B has a higher pitch than A, and C has a higher pitch than B. We could probably figure that out with no help, right? A, B, C, D, E. So it keeps going up. The G cleft is placed on the second line. So we see this. This is the G cleft. And you could tell that where it circles right here, that's going to be the G. So we know that this G is going to line up here. That's a G. So from there, it's going to go up, A, B, C. And from this G, it's going to go down, F, E. Does it make sense? So that circles what we're on. Starting with G, the remaining degrees can now be named. Degrees below G are moving backwards, so they move backwards in the alphabet. Degrees above the G restart the sequence A, B, and start going up. We get on the <laughs> treble clef, this is what we call the treble clef, the spaces are named, you could say the acrostic face. So the first space F, second space A, third space C, and the fourth space face. That's how you could kind of remember it if you wanted to remember it quickly, which note they are, F-A-C-E, face. The lines could be remembered as every good boy does fine. So if you're looking for the actual notes, every good boy does fine, using it as an acrostic. Now the F cleft is the cleft for the male thing. Now we could see that this is circled around the F and so this line is F, and everything from that line goes up, and anything below that line goes down. Again, we can kind of figure that out, no help. So on the F clef, we would say the lines say, good boys do fine always. Just a little acrostic. And whereas the spaces, all cows eat grass. Just thinking of cute little ways to remember it. And again, when you're singing, you're not necessarily thinking of the notes. You're just going to put this together. But we're giving you the idea of how things work. Now, in music notation, a note is a musical word. The body or the head is placed on the degree for the pitch to be sounded. So the body of here is actually going to be on a note or space. And wherever that note is, that's what pitch we're actually singing. Now, I know seventh grade is giving flashbacks to you, but again, we're building some technicalities here to help build us up. Now, most church music is written for four voice pitch ranges. We're going to start putting things together now. There are high and low female ranges, and they're placed on the G. G staff, right here, the treble clef staff, and we're going to have the high ladies, at sopranos, and then we're going to have the altos, those ladies who have a lower voice. The, <coughs> woohoo, that was cool. Good. Gremlins, I got a brand new clicker thing. Max, did it die on me? What are you doing? <laughs> He's trying to find it. See, technical things. All right? So the bass is going to be the lower male voice part and is at the bottom of the sequence on the F staff. So, all right. Good. Now I'm going to get to where I was supposed to be. Whereas here, the male vo things, we're going to have the high males like me is a tenor, and one day in heaven I'll be a bass. Those are the lower male pitches. 
Now, the soprano is the high-pitched and is usually the song's melody line. You're going to see the, the female melody line as the top note in every song. Underneath that is going to be the lower female voice. It's going to be the lower note on, that fir- on the top staff, the treble clef staff. The tenor is going to be the higher male voice range, and you're going to see that on the highest note of the bottom staff. And the bass is going to be the lower male voice on the bottom of the F staff. Now, we're going to put this together in a second. We're teaching you, and then we're going to put it together, all right? I know, seventh grade uh, flashbacks. Now, we have length notation. This is how long we hold it out. Each grouping of beats is called a measure. And so if there are four beats to a measure, after four beats, that measure is completed. Measures are separated from one from another by measure bars. These vertical lines that separate them. They extend from the top of the line to the bottom of the line, and they let you know on a measure. Again, seventh grade flashbacks. Now each syllable, this is going to be important, each syllable in the lyrics of a song are associated with a single note. Now, this is where we're starting to to apply it. Every note is going to represent a syllable, not a word, a syllable. For example, what is a syllable? It is how many times your jaw moves together. Syllable. Syllable. There are three syllables in the word syllable. And so in order to sing syllable, I would need three notes to sing it. Does that make sense? This is indicated by the placement of the note on the staff. It died on me again. All right, so here's the length notation. With this, we have a whole note. This carries out the entire length of the measure. We have a half note, a quarter note, an eighth note, and then it goes down to a sixteenth, a thirty-second, and so on and so forth. I don't haven't seen a sixty-fourth note in forever. Don't don't unless you're playing an instrument, you don't want to see that one. The length of a note is measured in beats. So how long we hold out the note is based off of the beats. Now at the beginning of a song, we have a time signature, and this lets us know how long the notes and measures are going to be. The time signature is made up of two numbers, one over another. It's a fraction. You can't even escape math and music. The top number tells us how many beats the measure receives, while the bottom number tells us how many beats the whole note receives. So let's give an example. With a time signature, the bottom is four. We understand that the whole note receives four beats. With the top number, it lets us know how many beats are in the measure. So in here, there are four beats that, control, that uh, are in each measure. Now, the tie is a curve line that connects two notes of the same pitch. The tie adds the length of two notes together as if they were one note. So you'll see here, this is a tie. Now, when singing, only one syllable is sung for the tied notes. Usually, you'll see a tied note when you'll have, in one stanza, a word that has two syllables, while the rest of the stanzas have one syllable. This lets you know during that one syllable, you hold it out. Again, we're going to put this together in a second. I'm giving you little pieces. We're going to put together. We're going to survive. I promise you. The slur is a curved line that connects two notes of different pitches. Notice here, we have a C connecting to a D. And because of this, they're going to be tied together. What you're going to do with your voice is you're going to go from the C to a D in a pitch. Ah, don't base off my singing. When singing, only one syllable is sung for the tied notes. Now, the fermenta which did not show up there as it was supposed to, sometimes is called a hold or a bird's eye. What you'll see is like a little curve and there's a little dot in the middle of it. That means to hold that note out as long as the director wants you to. Now, during the time of that hold, the rest of the measure stops going. It pauses until we go back to singing again. The fermenta, there was a picture of it right here leaves the length of the note or the rest up to the discretion of the director. Counting is discontinued while the note or rest is being held. Now we go to the hand motion. Sometimes people just think that I'm having a seizure or something, but there's actually like a reason why I move my hands. Let's kind of describe this. 
Hand motions are used by song leaders to help singers keep their place inside of music. All hand motions begin with a downbeat. So you'll notice that my hand will go down. That means that we're on the first note of the, fir- of the measure, down. And then with the upbeat, at the last note of the measure, we'll move my hand up. So the last measure, first measure. Or the last note in the measure, the first note of the measure. This helps p- singers know where we're at. If you could see where we're heading to, we're fixing to start of the next measure. The director's hand goes down. Everybody knows where we are. This helps keep everyone together. So it's, I'm not just doing this for the fun of it. There's actually something to it. And that if you lose your place of where we're at, you wait for the downbeat and join back in. Make sense? Now, for a 4-4 time, so if there are four beats to a measure, the quarter note gets the beat. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Four. And so there's actually a rhythm. I'm not just waving like a bird. There's actually something that we're trying to gun for. If there's a 3-4 time, for example, we'll move it a little bit differently. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And so, by the way, this is why it's important for the singers to look up to the song director from time to time so you know where we're at. And we could stay together. Now, this is important. What I'm trying to do is that we want to sing at the same time. Nothing like when everybody's on their own tempo and we've got some people starting this measure here and this people starting here. And so we would like to start the word at the same time. This is part of what the song leader is doing is trying to keep us at the same place if it works out. So let's go to the practical application, all right? All of this to get us to here, all right? Turn with me in your songbooks to page number 587 inside of our hymn books, and we come to the song, At Calvary. At Calvary. And with this, let's see if we could learn. I'm going to have the pianist come up in. She's going to help me out in just a second. And I want us to see if we learned anything, or at least we could put it together. So you said, I didn't know we were going to get tested. I wasn't awake for most of it. That's right. We're going to carry it through. We want to help us so that we we can become the best singers we possibly can. Page number 586, the song At Calvary. Let's start off and see what we can learn. All right, let's find some basic information. Who is the lyric writer? Who wrote this song? Where would we find this information? It would be on the top left. Who wrote this song? William Newell. Very good. William Newell, he's the one who wrote the words. All right. Who wrote the ly- lyrics? There are the actual music. Who wrote the music? Where would we find this information? Top right. On the top right. Who wrote the music? Daniel Towner. Daniel Towner. Very good. And what's the time signature? 4-4. Four, four. Four, four. It'd be 4-4 four, four time. So the whole note is going to get four beats, and there's going to be four beats to a measure. So when we direct it, it's going to go one, two, three, four. One, two, three. Three, four. And so what you're going to see in this song is measure lines. And each of those measure lines are going to have four beats. Notice the second measure. We have a quarter note, a quarter note, and a half note. So a quarter note takes one beat. The quarter note takes one beat. And the half note takes two beats. That's four beats altogether. So each time we have... um, Each measure is going to have the four beats. So this helps us to place the emphasis. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And again, it helps us to understand how long we hold out that note. Make sense so far? Good. Now let's try the first note. All right? The soprano. Now notice the sopranos. The women have the top treble clef. Now what is the first note for the soprano? What is that note? It is G. So can you play G for me? So this is going to be the note that the ladies are going to start on. Play it again. Good. Now, how many of you even know if you're a soprano or or, or alto? All right. Do you have a high female voice or low female voice? All right. If you're middle, you pick one. But good. All right. Now, what is the alto starting note? E is correct. Can you play E? E. And so that's going to be the first note. Years. All right. Now we go to the men. Ah, that didn't go. We go to the men. 
we go to the, the tenor. The tenor, what is that note going to be to start off with? It'd be C, middle C. Can you play middle C? Good, it sounds like my voice. Middle C. All right. So this is where the tenors will start. Play it again. And then those who have basses, like Zeb one day, right? What is that uh, bass note going to start off with? C. C, low C. All right. And so this is where we would go at. Now, whenever we sing these parts, the main melody line is going to be, of course, the very top note of all of this. But because we have the ability to, you could pick the part that you're at, and you can sing the notes of that part. It's still melody, but we're breaking it up, and it adds more flourish. It adds more, um, I'm looking for the word, uh, it fills it in a little bit more. All right? Now, I know that I'm the wrong person because I could write music, I could play music, but I can't sing music. I have to do my best. That's where you guys will have to fill in your gap. So I know that... I very rarely start on the right note. My wife's like, yeah. <laughs> I could work on it a little bit more, but let's try that, all right? Miss Leah, can you hit the first notes for every... Uh, let's start with um, um, sopranos. Sopranos, see if you could just hum this note. Okay? Altos. Tenors. Oh, that's mm, mm, basses. All right. Now what I want to do, now that we found our notes, let's see if we can actually um, hum this. All right. I don't want you to sing the lyrics. I want you to ignore the lyrics right now, and I want you to follow the notes. Now, don't play fast. Play at a decent speed. But I want you to follow your note line. All right? Does everybody know where you're at? Do you know the alto line? The tenor line? So the tenor line is going to be the top note of that very bottom clef. Okay? The bass. All right? And while she plays this, I want you to follow the notes. And I want you to notice the length of the notation, how long we hold out that beat, and the pitch. Let's just see if we could put it together. All right, play, please. What we're trying to do, and there's a lot more to it, but I'm just trying to give you some basic pieces that you could add as we sing, that you could say, all right, I don't know which note I'm supposed to hit. Now I'm trying to help you so you know the note. You could also follow along that if we're hitting a 4-4, 3-3, four, four, three, three, <coughs> you could also tell that where we're going to start. For example, when I start years, I will do the um, downbeat on the first one. Years I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not, my Lord was crucified. Knowing not, it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Good. And so with that, you could kind of keep take note, how long are we holding out the notes? Where are we supposed to be singing at? And what are we supposed to sing? This understanding just adds a little bit more to our congregational singing as we try to do our best for the Lord. 
Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.